Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased point of view as usual. Um, today, not really a theorem. Well, in the end, there will be a theorem, but more a very, let's call it controversial axiom of mathematics, which is uh, very popular and very controversial, and it deserves to be much more well known than it actually is. So the so-called axiom of choice. So what is the axiom of choice? Well, we will see. Um, in the end, there will be a certain list of axioms, uh, building foundations of mathematics in some sense, and all of them are sound reasonably harmless. And then there is this axiom of choice, which is a little bit debatable. Um, so some mathematicians like it, some mathematicians don't like it, some philosophers like it, some philosophers don't like it. Uh, but most, I think, are uh, on the same page as I am if I just say, well, some days I like it, some days I don't. And we will see on my last, last slide why actually I would prefer that perspective on the axiom of choice. So kind of the problem is that it's not really the preferred choice uh, in some sense because it produces kind of logical monsters, logical disasters. But you also kind of can't do without because otherwise you con can construct logical disasters or in some sense problems. Uh, so you kind of can't do without. Um, so I will take the following perspective in the end, you will see uh, why I would claim it actually works even if we don't believe in it. But before uh, waffling too much, so let's just get started with kind of the classical um, classical reason or the, the historical reason why the axiom of choice actually came up in some sense. Um, so everything is linked in the description. In particular, there's a very nice uh, page where I stole this picture from. And it, it's really beautiful. It explains this idea of self-reference. So self-reference is always a problem. Um, here, uh, probably the most famous one, this sentence is false, which is really a problem because, well, if it's true, then the sentence just says that it's false. And if it's false, then, uh, well, the sentence would be true. So hmm, is it true or false? We can't really tell. So you always run into problems um, if you could formulate those self-reference paradoxes, and there are zillions of those in uh, classical language, in just our language, everyday language, if you could formulate them in some logical system. In one way or the other, you run into problem. And it's always kind of the same idea. So all of these things like, like Gödel's incomplete the theorem in the end, it formulates the sentence uh, in some form in, uh, in, in a system containing certain types of logics or lo certain logical system. And this just kind, kind of means that this sentence cannot be proven from your system of logic. Another example in everyday language is, for example, I am lying. And well, have I just said the truth or not? Uh, if I have said the truth, then I was lying. If I was lying, then I have said the truth. So it, it, it's, in everyday language, you will find zillions of examples. And as I said, the main problem is, uh, or the main problem from the viewpoint of logic, mathematics, and philosophy is if you kind of face that uh, a sentence like this sentence is false in your favorite logic system. And Russell did exact, exactly that. He found a version of self-reference of this sentence is false in uh, set theory. And set theory, something like 130 years ago, was kind of everyone wanted it to be a kind of the foundations of mathematics. And it's kind of a problem. So uh, what Russell did is written here. So if you take a set and you call it R, R like Russell, and it's defined by, it contains all X which do not contain themselves, though it should be a do not contain themselves here. Then you might wonder, what about the set R itself? Is it in itself or is it not in itself? Well, if it is in itself, by construction of the set R, it's not in, ex in, in itself. And if it's not in it itself, it is in itself. And this is a really classical example of self-reference. The, the, the set is kind of referring to itself. And that's a problem. It always causes a problem. So we now have a uh, kind of a contradiction here. This set kind of can't exist, right? It is contained in itself. And at the same time, it's not contained in itself. That's a huge problem if you want to build foundations of mathematics. As I just said, if you have the sentence is false in one way or the other in your system of logic, you are kind of dead. You don't want that. And and people start to think about how to solve that, or let's say how to kick out the set R of our set of axioms. And there are many approaches to do that. Um, the most popular one is what I call ZF, 
let's say Mailer Frankel approach. There are di different ones linked in the description. You, you don't not, do not even need to use set theory. There are already different axiom sets for set theory. You don't do, need to do that. You can do type theory, homotopy type theory, topoid theory, category theory. You could throw a lot of axiom systems on your foundations of mathematics. This is certainly the most famous one. And um, I kind of don't want to discuss the question whether you should believe in one or the other because it's kind of a matter of taste anyway. So let me rather try to explain this Samuel Frankel a set theory without writing down the axioms because, well, there are nine axioms ish, and they all read well. They they are formulated in its formal logic, of course. That's the whole point. So they all read a little bit strange ish. Let me just explain the main strategy here. So the main strategy: how to avoid um, this paradox due to Russell or this funny set R. So what they do is they kind of try to build set theory uh, using this picture in mind. Like I give you a certain number of bricks and whatever you can build from those bricks, that's a set, that's the approach. A little bit more formally is um, the axioms, the, one of the first axioms uh, says that there is some set, okay? Sometimes it says there's some infinite set, depends a little bit on your taste. Anyway, so there is some set and that's just, I mean, yeah, sure, I accept that. If I want to build a theory uh, on sets, then I should <laughs> kind of, assume the existence of at least one set. And that's an axiom. There exists a set that's an axiom, something you can't prove from more fundamental principles. Uh, so this is kind of okay. I, I would give it, a, I think it's kind of okay. Uh, the second one is roughly of this form. You want to define a notion of equal and in the set of set, set theory, it's two, two things are equal if this have the same elements. I kind of also accept that one. And then comes the main strategy that they propose and I kind of also accept this one which is basically saying you have a set, you have another set, you have an operation that you like, for example, taking union and whatever you do gives you another set, right? It's this brick principle. You have a brick, you have another brick, put them together, you get already a piece of a wall and you can use it then again to build bigger, um, bigger walls. That's this idea of using bricks. And that kind of throws out uh, the, the Russell set because in the end it turns out that the Russell set is just not a set, right? So how do you solve the um, question whether this statement is false, is true or false? Well, you ignore it. You just throw out the question. This, there is no yes or no statement related to this question. Uh, this statement is false. You just kick it out of your logic. It's not provable. It's, it's not accepted in your logic. And you kind of do the same here in this um, brick type fashion. Okay, I kind of, kind of do accept that. And then there's a slightly funny sounding axiom but in the end, it's it's a form of induction. It's it not quite, link is in the description. Um, it's called co 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 the axiom of foundation, but it's kind of an induction thing. So mathematical induction is a very powerful tool. In some sense, you can't produce that from simpler axioms, so you just put it in your back of axioms. And yes, I would like to accept that. And then there's a slightly funny thing, which is the axiom of choice. And we are not really sure whether we want to accept it or not. Um, Roughly speaking, it just says every family of non-empty sets has a choice function. Okay, sounds harmless, but let's go into some details here. So what I want to try to say on this page is that this strategy to throw out the, the paradox given by this statement is false by using a brick principle and all, all kind of axioms that you throw uh, into this back of axioms are kind of okay, kind of believable, acceptable. And then there's one that sounds a little bit strange uh, so let's have a look at this one, the axiom of choice, AC in the notation for today. And it's actually a pretty simple statement. It's what I've illustrated here above. Um, so you have a certain type of families of sets. In this case, you have five. And then there is a choice function, which is you pick out one element from each set. Okay. Sounds pretty harmless, but let's think about uh, two examples. So for example, you can have an infinite number of, uh, of shoes. Uh, of pairs of shoes, right? a set, uh, an infinite number of them, whatever. And the question is, can you produce a choice function? Meaning, can you produce a rule in some sense such that everyone would pick the same shoe out of each set, right? I have a, a lot of sets uh, containing shoe and another shoe and I have more of them and I have infinitely many of them, bop, bop, bop. And the question is, can I tell you a rule such that both of us would 
picks the same shoe. And yes, I can. I can say something like, yeah, please take the left shoe. Uh, that's a rule. So we have an infinite number of, of sets, but I give you a rule. So I give you a choice function without actually needing that axiom. Right? I, the axiom proposes the existence of a choice function. But for some sets, that's actually needed. Um, so for example, if I would replace my shoes, so this example is due to Russell, due to, due to Russell. Uh, so if you replace uh, shoes with socks and you kind of assume the socks are indistinguishable, and now you have, uh, again, pairs of socks, a lot of them, but you can't really tell the difference which one is which, uh, can you still produce a choice function that such as me and you pick the same sock out of each set? That's less clear. Why should that work? Not quite clear, but the axiom proposes that yes, this works. That makes it already a little bit, a little bit fishy, right? It's 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 not like the other axioms. The other axioms are fairly harmless. Like if I have a set, I have another set, then the union is a set. That sounds pretty harmless to me. This one is a bit fishy. Turns out, um, and here's the theorem that um, Gödel proved that you can not prove not. AC, a very complicated. So not AC is not a theorem in uh, in Samuel of Frankel's set theory. So you can't prove it from the other axioms. You really need to throw it in if you want it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the statement due to Cohen, which was much later, kind of says the opposite. So um, you can also throw in not AC if you want. In other words, this axiom is really independent of, of the other axioms. And it's kind of your preferred choice, axiom of choice if you want, whether you take it or not. In some sense, it's kind of a weird statement and it's really nice theorem, uh, independence. So this is my theorem for today, independence of the axiom of choice. This is funny axiom and it's actually independent of the other axioms. Kind of a fun statement. And I would really like to take, uh, we'll see it on the next slide a little bit in more details. I would really like to take this approach of Niels Bohr. Uh, of course, Niels Bohr, very famous physicist. Um, let, let me just quote Niels Bohr. Of course not, of course not. Come on, of course not. But I'm told it works even if you don't believe in it. And this was the quotation, uh, just answer to the question, do you believe a horseshoe bring, brings you luck or not? Right? He just, this ball just says, of course I don't, of course not, come on. But it, if it works, then it works anyway. Uh, that's kind of the approach, my approach to the axiom of choice as well. So that some days, yeah, I would take it, and some days I wouldn't, and it's independent anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, whether I believe it's true or not. It actually doesn't matter at all. Um, and let me finish by telling you a little bit why this axiom is so controversial. I mean, I kind of sketched it with my shoe and sock example, um, but still, you can still believe that, uh, well, socks are pretty nice, sets of socks, well, who cares? And of course you can assume the existence of a choice function, why not? But turns out the choice is much more delicate in mathematics. Um, so in the beautiful book, uh, Axiom of Choice by uh, Herrlich, linked to the description, um, th there are basically three chapters. There are more chapters, but there are three. And one of them is called Disasters Without Choice. One of them is called Disasters With Choice. And one of them is called Disasters Either Way. So it, it kind of doesn't matter, right? Take Niels, Niels, Niels Bohr's approach. It kind of doesn't matter. You, you run into trouble either way in some sense. So let, let me discuss some of them. So um, for example, if you would, right, we now know choice is independent. So it's a matter of taste whether I want to take it into my axiom system or not. Um, if you don't want it, then you get something like, uh, the, the, the notion of finite is not quite clear anymore. And there are several approaches to that and all of them are equivalent as soon as you get that choice. But if you don't, then they're actually different, which is kind of a weird thing. Um, if you're more like an algebra type of person like me, then you get something like vector spaces might not have bases, which is really bad in practice, right? Vector spaces without bases. That's really bad. And you also get statements in, uh, in, in graph theory, for example, something, something like um, you can have a graph uh, such as all finite subgraphs are, can be colored with two colors, but the graph itself can't, which is also a bit, a bit strange. So you have several disasters turning up in various parts of mathematics. I could uh, make this, this much longer. The real numbers are always very good. So there are a lot of disasters appearing in the real numbers uh, here as well, of course. Here we'll see the real numbers in a second. Uh, a lot of disasters and more in analysis and so on. 
So if you don't want the axiom of choice, you run into those problems. OK, then you might say, OK, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe let's accept it. But you will run into other problems. So there's just, just, just no way out. So here are some disasters with choice. Um, so probably the most um, famous one is the existence of non-measurable sets. Strictly speaking, some of these are not equivalent to the axiom of choice. But anyway, um, let's ignore that. So you can have sets without volume. That's already kind of strange. So you can have non-measurable sets. And as usual, if you have one of them, you have many of them, uh, really many of them. Uh, so this is already kind of strange. So if you accept the axiom of choice, you accept the existence of those sets, basically. Uh, one for more kind of classical analysis would be <laughs> this harmless looking equation here, which is like a linear equation, I can have non-continuous solutions. And as soon as you have one of them, you have many of them. That's kind of a weird statement anyway. Uh, here's one from algebra again, if you want. So um, R and R plus Q are actually equivalent as uh, Q vector spaces, which is kind of weird. And there are many, many more, many, many more uh, statements that you get disasters that you get without choice. And there are also disasters either way. So it's a, so really take Niels Bohr's, I take Niels Bohr's approach. Um, so for example, um, in, in game theory, you can construct certain deterministic games which have winning strategies and could construct certain non-deterministic games which do not have any winning strategies or um, con construct in the set sense of the axiom of choice anyway. So it, it's kind of, no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, so um, point is axiom of choice, nice theorem, it's independent of the other axioms. Uh, more natural actions, whatever that means. And yeah, it kind of doesn't matter whether you like it or not, you will run into trouble anyway. So the best approach in my opinion would be on one day you accept it, on the other day you reject it, depends a bit what you want to do. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed my raffle and I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.